amazing show on the road. Um, and we have Alexis Salazar. Raise your hand, Alexis. She's our wonderful um, intern. She'll be letting people in. Um, my name's Alexandra Vandekamp, Executive Director of Gemini Inc. And we're San Antonio's Writing Arts Center. Many of you know us, but maybe not all of you do. Um, I'm just thrilled to have you join us tonight. We have two great authors, you know, um, who are going to kind of weigh in on this very interesting, totally unprecedented times that we have. Um, and, you know, the mission of Gemini Inc. is to teach the craft of writing to individuals of all skill levels so they can bring their stories to life. And I can't imagine two more intriguing storytellers than our featured author, David Shields, and our featured moderator, John Philip Santos. Um, they're both, I would call them multi-instrumentalists in the world of art. They could easily be telling a story through film or documentary, memoir, nonfiction. They kind of easily move between genres. And I think that makes them really interesting writers. And then for just a million other reasons, we can't wait to hear what they're gonna say tonight. So um, a few housekeeping rules, just keep yourselves muted during the talk. Um, at about 7.20 or so, a little after, um, we will begin more of a general audience Q&A. And I ask, please feel comfortable and free to just post questions in the chat box. And then I'll read from some of them and John Philip can as well. And, um, you know, we'll be able to have the two authors answer your questions as well. Um, we are recording this session just to let you know. And um, so if you get like a please recording, press continue button that comes up, just press continue. Um, and I think I just have the very lovely job of introducing our guest moderator. And I'm, I'm gonna introduce him now. Um, he's John Philip Santos. He's a member of the Gemini board, which we're so um, thrilled about. He's a writer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker. Um, and his two memoirs, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, a great title, um, which was a National Book Award finalist, um, and The Farthest Home is an Empire of Fire, together tell the ancestral stories of his mother and father's families, an American origin story of the centuries-long migrations that emerged out of Spain, Mexico, and the lands that became South Texas. His book of poems is Songs Older Than Any Known Singer. In 1979, he became the first Mexican-American Rhodes Scholar. Um, as an Emmy-nominated television producer, John Philip has produced more than 40 broadcast documentaries and news programs on cultural themes in 16 countries for CBS and PBS. His journalism and commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Texas Monthly, and other publications. And since 2010, he's been University Distinguished Scholar in Mestizo Cultural Studies teaching in the Honors College at the University of Texas, San Antonio. He was awarded the Texas Medal for the Arts and Literature in 2017. He's our guest moderator tonight, and I'm just gonna hand it over to you, John Philip, and let you kick it off with David. <laughs> Gracias, Alexandra, um, and welcome to everybody. This is uh, such an incredible honor tonight uh, to have a conversation with David Shields. Uh, so um, I'm glad all of you could join us uh, to, um, to really uh, get a sense of what um, what it is that David Shields is bringing to American letters that uh, I, I dare say no one else can do or might have ever imagined doing. We, <laughs> I, I feel kind of kindred uh, with David in a couple of different ways, but one is that you know we were born uh, just a couple of months apart, so there might be some kind of astrological synchronicity in the midst of. Um, you know, what we will explore tonight in terms of our shared affinities. Um, David is an internationally uh, best-selling author of 23 books, 23 books, uh, including uh, a, a book that really is uh, canonical for me, Reality Hunger, uh, which was recently named one of 100 most important books uh, in the last decade. Um, the thing about life is that one Day You'll Be Dead, another one of my favorites, New York Times bestseller, Black Planet, finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Other People Take Some Mistakes, uh, which was the New York Times uh, book review editor's choice. Um, one I don't know yet, which I'm gonna find, Nobody Hates Trump More Than Trump, an intervention, it was published in 2018. 
And last year he published The Trouble with Men, Reflections on Sex, Love, Marriage, Porn, and Power. Another one I've got to get to. I mean, 23 books. Uh, you got to uh, get, you know, get the stockpile rolling and just uh, dig in. Um, in addition to his work as a writer, uh, David has done extraordinary work as a filmmaker, uh, a collaboration with none other than James Franco. I think you're totally wrong, a quarrel, uh, which I, I've, I've read is one of the best buddy movies ever uh, done. Um, on Amazon Prime, iTunes, Apple TV, Voodoo, Vimeo, Canopy, Google Play. And then the remarkable film we're gonna talk a little bit about tonight um, called A Lynch, A History, which is a 2019 documentary about Marshawn Lynch's use of silence, echo, and mimicry as key tools of resistance. Uh, incredible reviews in the New Yorker, Nation, all kinds of other publications. Uh, he's a recipient of a Guggenheim, NEH, NEA fellowships and the senior contributing editor of Conjunctions. David has published fiction and nonfiction in the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, Esquire, Yale Review, Salon, Slate, Tin House, Public Space, McSweeney's Believer, Huffington Post, Los Angeles Review of Books, and Best American Essays. Uh, this is an extraordinary uh, scribe of our times, a, a true master. So I just want to welcome David to. Gemini Inc. Thank you, David, for joining us. Thank you so much. Con mucho gusto, senor. Um, it's great to be here. I'm such a fan of Alexandra, of John Philip Santos, of Paulette, who I see is here. Donovan, I know, is in my class. I don't know if, if some of the, uh, hi, Paulette, some of the other folks I may have crossed paths with. Anyway, it's really lovely to be here, there's so much to talk about. It's a very exciting Saturday night. What a time! I mean, we, are, we are living. You know, there's the old that old Chinese uh, um, proverb about "May you live in interesting times." Uh, I know what you mean. I don't, think, I don't think they could have ever imagined such interesting times as these. And I know I was talking to. A, I'm sorry, John Philip. I didn't didn't mean to interrupt. Kelly, yeah. I was talking to. A friend of mine who said that she never thought that she'd live during an important era. And I guess, I don't know whether <clears throat> Trumpian proto-fascism constitutes an important era and or living under the star of a global pandemic, but I thought it was an interesting point that we were living our doggy lives in our doggy way. And now if so, I think all of our lives are important by the fact that we're alive on planet Earth. But it was an interesting idea that she was saying, you know, the one thinks of, you know, Anne Frank of living in an attic for however many years, you know, what was that like? Or right. how would we have responded in Berlin in 1933? Yeah. And you know, well, <laughs> this is our double chance. What is it like to live in our attic by ourselves? There's not a gun at our neck yet, but there's at least possible guns at some of our necks. And what is it like? What, what inner resources do we have to get through this time, which is uh, yeah. unbelievably challenging. I think even if we are healthy, even if we are not being deported. I, I find it uh, extraordinarily challenging, but also weirdly revelatory. I mean, yeah. Everybody gets a taste of abjection and the possibility of revelation. Um, I'm wondering just you know, maybe to begin with, just tell us something about what these months have been like for you in terms of where you are. You're in Seattle, so you're in a multiple epicenter, epicenter of a couple of the, you know, conundrums that we're confronting at the moment. What, what's it been like since, since March in Seattle? It's a good point. It is the epicenter of a certain amount of, I forget what they call Seattle, Portland, and New York City. What's the term? Were apocalyptic nightmares or something in Trump's imagination? What was the term that were catastrophe yeah. cities or some or such? I I'm not sure. Either Sorry? Way. I, I either forgot or repressed it. I'm not sure. I know. It's uh, a curious pride, of course. And then 
obviously, the, in, in many ways, COVID emerged in the US, at least possibly here. Uh, and so you're right, it is a, a double or triple epicenter of things facing. So how, how have, I mean, I've, it's been <laughs> an extraordinarily challenging, I'm trying to think of what I can say that would be useful to our general group here without oversharing. I'm mean, trying to think of what, I guess I think a lot you know, a Jean-Paul Sartre's notion of radical contingency, which he articulates in Nausea and elsewhere, mm. whereby he talks about how the only way to live with the existential fact of our own mortality is to be hyper aware of the fact that the fact that, that we die renders life, at least in any final sense, at least possibly meaningless. And the only way to make one's life have meaning is to live in radical contingency with that fact of mortality. And obviously, you know, the fact of the pandemic makes our lives almost literally radically contingent on a second by second and day by day level. I think it forces us to ask ourselves what it is that we actually care about. What it is, you know, do we really care about our art? Do we care about our actual lives? Do we care about someone else? A friend of mine was saying that she was invited to give a poetry reading and she did not have a poem that she felt was equal to the event, both the event of Black Lives Matter and of the pandemic. And I said, well, that, that's, that's calling out the value of your poetry. You should have a poem that's equal to that event. You know, it's, it's on all of us to create a poem that we wouldn't be embarrassed to read at an event that was there to honor Black Lives Matter activists and or to honor um, essential workers during during COVID. It's not that art is is useless, which she feared it might be, but rather, what art could we create that would possibly be meaningful in relation to this double and triple quadruple catastrophe that we live in? I mean, perhaps I'm I'm hiding amidst abstraction, John. John Philip, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Well, I mean, what's been like specifically in Seattle, where y'all were among the first to to really feel the onset of the pandemic, and then the scene of these extraordinary um, manifestations in terms of of the protest response to, you know, violence against uh, black folks at the hands of the police. Um, uh, Y'all are in a sense a kind of a capital of the urgent America now. I mean, what what uh, what does it felt like to go out into the streets amidst this time? Right. I think you know. I'm in a bit of a. It's a bit of complication. I was living in in Denver for about f four months of it. So from May through August, I was actually in Denver working on a documentary film, and so. I, I miss the core of, you know, um, of Chaz. I could ask Paulette how, if she was uh, in and involved in, with the whole Capitol Hill autonomous zone. So I was not here at the heart of the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm. Um, so there was that. And then I was here in March, April, and May at the height of of COVID arriving. And then I've been back in Seattle in August and September, or September and Oct October rather. So, you know, how have, how have I responded? I'd love to know how you've responded, John Philip. It's not as if San Antonio has been by any means immune to any of this stuff, both you know, Black Lives Matter protests, as well as COVID out outbreaks. I think, 
you know, I think it is a little bit of a trace or die that we find out what it is that we actually do, you know, from each according to his, his ability for each according to his deed. And I guess, you know, I think of myself as a deeply political, a deeply engaged person, but I guess if I'm honest, the reality of what I've done, I don't know if it's partly influenced by COVID, is that I've really, I've really focused on, on my work. You know, big surprise, I, you know, I finished a documentary, Lynch a History, and so I've been, you know, that, that recently came out on the Sundance channel, and I was, I was busy releasing that. Um, I finished a new book called The Very Last Interview, so I've been, been, been busy writing that. I'm working on the adaptation of my book about Trump into a documentary film. So I've, that I've been- That was the project in Denver? Sorry? That was the project in Denver? Right. So. And so, you know, I think, I think it's a bit of, I mean, I'm, some of it is a little bit maybe revelatory in ways that are sort of scary or dark. You know, have I been as active politically as I should have been or, or could have been? How am I contributing to the end of the Trumpian reign on November 3rd? I mean, I'm doing all sorts of things, but, you know, I'm doing, to my surprise and maybe my slight horror, I'm trying, I'm focusing a lot of my contributions in my work. It, it, it appears, I believe, in my work. You know, I think that Lynch of History is a contribution to Black Lives Matter. I, I think the, the book and film about Trump are insights into Trump. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm bleeding money to flip the Senate. You know, that's all I do is spend money on flipping the Senate. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. But, your... you know, but, um, yeah. but I think to me what's interesting, you know, I grew up in a very deeply politically engaged family where, you know, basically weekend outings were going to anti-war marches in Golden Gate Park was basically family vacations for us. So, um, you know, I think, I'm, I'm politically engaged, but I'm also deeply engaged, alas, partly because of COVID, by my work. I mean, how does that answer strike you as problematic, John Phil? Tell no, me it it what you've done. But I'm, but I'm curious about just what it means uh, in terms of your day-to-day -day life. You know, in, in the context of our, you know, collective sequestration, you know, how has your daily writing life either been kind of protected and continued or changed? What's the, what's the variation? Are you, are you a kind of a nine to five, you know, bankers hours writer? Are you a, you know, a uh, kind of secretive note taker assemble into routines and drafts in the middle of the night? Or what's, what's the uh, program been in terms of, the fallout of the schedule. I think you might have sort of broken in to my Gmail account, John Phil, because that's definitely my approach at the latter, is very much uh, a secret of note taker who is writing at all times and all hours. You know, the most of my crucial revelations are my inscrutable notes to myself at 3 a.m., which I then try and decipher under a microscope, you know, the following morning. But, um, I think one thing that's interesting to me as a way to stay safe and sound amidst a galaxy of, of cataclysms, I think I've sort of tripled down on collaboration. Partly is that a, a function or a feature of my sort of late middle age writing life is that I do a lot of collaboration on books and films. I would, say, I would suggest uh, early, late middle age. I well, I was going to say early old age is what I would say. But. Early, I would say early late. Uh, early late. Now, if I, I was born in July 56, did you come after me, John Philip, or before? Uh, September 57. 
Oh, you're a baby. Oh, yeah, I'm just, well, I'm, but I'm feeling the press of, you know, of the time. So There you go. But I, I still call it early, late, middle age. I, I early, late that. is good. Yeah. Yeah. Early, early, late is good. I mean, part of me feels like I'm, yeah, I feel pretty, I mean, I feel like everyone has an age they are. And in my grandiosity, I think I'm always 27. If I think of myself, I'm perpetually 27. The age so basically at which never started, not 27. The age at which rock stars traditionally OD. So that... <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. But um, I think one thing I've done, I think partly it was a feature of, of my writing and incipient cinematic life over the last 10 years is that I have had been doing a lot of collaboration. And I think amidst amidst COVID, because of all of these Zoom platforms that we all are using, I think as a way not to tunnel down into my own private sanctum sanctorum, I've really focused on a whole series of literary and cinematic collaboration. So I'm definitely am working all the time, you know, really like it's weird how during the weekend, here we are, Saturday, you know, yep. at 7 p.m. in San Antonio, and we're doing this, which, which feels great to me, but it's like there is, there is no weekend, there is no week, there is no nothing, as we all say, you know, which I find sort of exciting. I mean, like, in a way, I've been practicing social distance yep. since I was nine years old, you know, <laughs> like, I've been socially distant <laughs> for a very long time, focused, yep. alas, on my 23 books, apparently. And so, um, as, the, as the universal Jewish grandmother would say, why not? Why not? <laughs> exactly. And so, what was I going to say? Um, I do think one stuff. thing that is a feature you're, you're of ready, my writing life and my artistic creative life is I agree, it's all hours. Yeah. You know, as I'm collaborating with people all over the world, I might have to get up at 3 a.m. and Zoom with someone from Amsterdam at, you know, at, at, at noon their time and I'll just hop up at 3 a.m. and Zoom with them. And so I would say, I'm not sure how well I'm answering your good question, but I just think I'm, I'm working, you know, at different times, you know, all over hopscotching as I can. I think the one thing that strikes me is that I'm not sitting there trying to write deathless American prose on my yellow legal pad at, at 9 a.m. drinking my chamomile tea. I mean, that's not something I'm doing. Like, I, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm sort of, I'm trying to be a social creature, sure. albeit remotely, so that I'm working on a filmic collaboration with someone. I'm working yep. on a book project with someone. So I feel like it's pushed me harder into being a social animal mm. because if we got any more isolated, I think yeah. I'd go stark raving mad. So I think it's driven me toward even a, a stronger collaborative mode. It's fantastic, you know. And how's your body? Um, you know, and the thing about life, um, you know, you talk about this book as a an autobiography of your body. How, how's your back? How, you know, how's the general program in terms of just your corporeality? How, how's the, the general hey, that's a great corporeality question. wavelength going? I mean, look at you, John. So do you look like you are ready to do a Jack LaLanne gym, gym I workout over there. I have a 10-year-old daughter. I've got to stay on the chase. So I like, know. My I God, you look like you are ready to do the, um, what was that guy, that guy who did those workouts during the 90s, like Richard Simmons. You look like you're ready to do the Richard I Simmons a, workout. I'm sweat out the oldies. As soon as we're done, I'm sweating the oldies tonight. I like it. So I'm I'm doing pretty well, actually. Like, I think, you know, I think that book was written in 2008 and oh. I think I had, you know, I had a bad back at the time, but I'm actually doing, I'm fine. I, I basically, sorry. The back thing is, is, is done. You've dealt with the Did back. You, it's basically fine. Like I basically, you know, I sort of really attacked it with a variety of, of um, approaches, including kind of a brilliant physical, therapist with the unlikely name of Wolfgang Broly. So, you know, I think I just sort of, I mean, I, you know, I don't have to, I mean, you know, I don't lift a hundred pound weights and, you know, but I'm basically fine. And I, 
you know, but it's a good point. How is one's corporeality is sort of the big question. I'm, I take a, a two hour walk every afternoon up a very steep hill. And, you know, I don't know if people have, have been swimming in San Antonio. I think, you know, pools have been closed here. I don't know if you guys are, are swimming at all. So Maybe basically I just get my long exercise every afternoon. Yeah. What are you guys doing for exercise? I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have our beautiful parks. And this morning I did a very long run in Hartberger Park, uh, a park here in San Antonio, and had the darshan of two coyotes. Um, wow. And, and then have recently been uh, doing some uh, workouts by this incredible tree that is, has these spiral torques in it, uh, a very old oak tree in the park. Uh, where this um, buck, uh, young buck, almost always comes and visits me in the morning. So, you know, wow. we're moving on. Um, wow. Hey, so let me ask you this question, because I've really been curious about this since I first discovered your work um, with Reality Hunger. And, and I, I don't think you've ever, at least I haven't seen yet where you might have done this, but how did your writing life start? What was, what was the inception of the journey that you're on as a writer. You mean not John Philip of Reality Hunger per se, but my no. writing life in general. Yeah, you're right. You're the whole before there were 23 books. You know, right? Uh, what What was the beginning of that story? Where did was it in high school? Was it in junior high? Or was it? I mean, it's an interesting question. I'll try not. I mean, it's to me it, it is interesting because it plays out in my writing life in very interesting ways, or at least to me. I think for me, the big trigger or one of the triggers was as a child, I had a just horrible stuttering problem. As a kid, I could hardly talk and I just had a severe stutter and could really not talk. And then in my 20s and 30s, I had a lot of speech therapy so that I could control it pretty well and do an event like this and feel perfectly comfortable. So I think a big trigger of my writing life is my childhood stutter. That so much of my drive to write, even my sort of graphomania of writing too many books is in my passion for writing, my drive to write and sort of how on the page in ways I couldn't as a person with a speech impediment um, and a desire to be somewhat transgressive on the page, to say stuff you're not supposed to say. All that, and also to my interest in literary collage strikes me as not unrelated to stuttering in that there's a way in which the jagged disfluency of literary collage is not unrelated to maybe childhood speech impediment. And then also too, I think a big trigger of it for me was growing up in, in Los Angeles and San Francisco, both of my parents were journalists and very politically active journalists. You know, I was sort of what used to be called a sort of red diaper or pink diaper baby. You know, I was sort of the child of communists or would be communists or quasi communists You know, very, very, very left-leaning, uh, political activist journalist. And so that was just the world I grew up in of, you know, anti-war marches and civil rights demonstrations and our family, our, our house constantly housed political activists. And I think a lot of, of my work is being a conversation in a strange way with my parents' journalism of taking my parents' belief in nonfiction and in a way in, in believing in political activism and trying to very much replicate it, but also sort of problematize it. I mean, you'd, you, one doesn't need to be Dr. Freud to see that a book like Reality Hunger in a way is an undoing in a way of my parents' belief in the transparency of straightforward journalism, if you see what I mean. I don't know how many people know that book. I mean, we should say it's a, it's a book of 
what assembled citations of of uh, oriented um, excerpted readings, uh, thematically lensed um, cuttings. Uh, mm -hmm. That's beautifully said. Did, did thematically you, lensed cuttings. That's that's gorgeous. So, were you reading your parents' journalism? I mean, you know, at the time I was that. My mom was the West Coast correspondent for the Nation magazine, and my dad was a political speech writer for uh, Democratic candidates in, in California. So, you know, they weren't super high profile, but they weren't, you know, they weren't totally nondescript either. So I was definitely reading th their journalism. And then I was you know, that proverbial kid, I was sort of the editor of my junior high school paper, editor of my high school paper. So it was and really, then, high, this began in high school, the spark was lit. Yeah, but, and then I think I wrote the single worst short story ever written by a high school student. Yeah, it was sure. just unbelievably bad, which was an attempt to sort of honor all of my parents, you know, p political work. And then in college, I was... I was writing for the college paper and I, under somewhat sort of the influence of new journalism, I was a fan of people like Hunter Thompson, Gay Talese, Joan, Joan Didion, Joe Esterhaas. You know, at the time, Rolling Stone was based in the Bay Area and I, I used to just love getting that big tabloid fold over version of Rolling Stone. Oh. I'm sure I'm totally dating myself when when Rolling Stone, it's hard to believe, I'm sure it was once a good magazine. I mean, now it's just a joke, but it was once a really influential yeah. and often extraordinarily well-written magazine. Yeah. So anyway, in college, I, I thought I was being a new journalist by writing supposedly nonfiction stories in which I was making stuff up. And I, I got into to a, a little bit of trouble for sort of fudging the facts. And so, which is sort of a key early moment for me, I either had to pivot toward a more respectable journalism yeah. or figure out a kind of poeticized new journalism, which was already fading, or pivot toward fiction, which I then did. I, I wrote three novels from basically 19, say 78 to 1993 and then a big kind of waterloo for me was trying to write my fourth novel in the mid 90s during my late 30s and i for some reason i forget alexandra if you were in seattle then or if paulette if you were working with me then but Basically, I was trying to write my fourth novel, and I just couldn't couldn't do it. I was heavily influenced by a lot of anthropological autobiography, a lot of self-reflexive documentary film, and a lot of stand-up comedy and performance art. And my would-be fourth novel became my first book of collage nonfiction. So. Amazing. That's my, but, that's my. Well, but what about this other, and one other question, I mean, there's so much to talk about. We Time is going to run short on us, but I want to get to a couple of these, like, uh, focus questions I've, I've always been curious about. So where, uh, where does, in terms of your, this literary polymorphism, you know, um, the sports, the sports vibe, you know, where, how does the sports, uh, so there's a basketball book. Black Planet, yeah, Black facing Planet. race during an NBA season, right. Um, uh, where does that come into the picture? How does that um, come into focus for you as part of your literary dharma? What's, at what point I know what you mean, John Philip. It is, I'm, a weird, I'm a weird polymorphism, or however you described it. Like, I know what you mean. I have books on war photography, on... What a beautiful, extraordinary... Book Thank you. Gotta seek out War is Beautiful. Thanks a lot. And then I have books on, you know, sports. And then I have a book on Trump. I've got a book on sexual trauma. I mean, I'm I am either at at worst you could say maybe I'm you know 
jack of all trades, master of none, at best you could say I have a nicely wide lens, you know, depending on, on your perspective. I just follow my instincts. A friend of mine who's, an am who's a student of 18th century literature, she had this wonderful phrase, she called me an amateur, which in 18th century, you know, amo, amas, amat, I just follow my loves. Mm. I'm an amateur in the best sense of, you know, I don't, you know, like I don't really respect or admire people who find a tiny niche mm. and just keep on producing the same book over and over yeah. and over again. Maybe it's probably commercially profitable or maybe it's. No. I mean, the only, the only person who comes to mind uh, with a comparable richness is somebody like George Plimpton, you know, uh, who had all of these different uh, courses of explorations uh, in his literary. In his That's interesting. I mean, Plimpton. Yeah. I mean, Pl I mean, yeah, I, mean, I know what you mean. I mean, there is one book of his about Edie Sedgwick, which I think is fantastic on oral biography in which he, which he co-wrote with Gene Stein, that's, that's an incredible book. Um, but um, sports, I mean, the, my dad was a part-time sports writer. I grew up a bit of a jock, believe it or not. I was like a, a fairly serious athlete in high school. And I was, I've always been very interested in this nexus of sports media and race, and especially mm. sports as this extraordinary, um, reverse angle mirror of American history. No. Sorry? Yeah, no, I'm just- uh, No, I mean, I just think, especially the NBA is, uh, it's an amazing way in which one can understand 400 years of American history through a funhouse mirror. There's a pretense. I mean, if you wanna know everything that you need to know about American history, just listen to sports talk radio for four hours and it's all there yeah. extraordinarily nakedly revealed like i felt like i got i pretty much knew trump was on the rise i dare say before other people did because i still have this sort of vestigial limb that still listens to sports talk radio <laughs> and that one can hear <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, what's so fascinating about sports is it pretends it's outside of politics. Beware of any realm that's telling you it's outside of politics. Politics is everywhere, as yeah. your essay say, John Philip on the Texas Rangers shows, like, or that film about Kevin Costner and Texas Rangers. Yeah. Politics is everywhere. Politics is about power and power is ubiquitous. Mm. And so I've always been terribly interested in sports as this fascinating tracer die that tells us way more than it thinks it does about American history, about the history of race, mm. about white vicariousness. And so I think, you know, of my 20 plus books, you know, three or four of them deal with sports. And I think that my most recent uh, film, Lynch, A History, is in a way a very loose adaptation of my 1999 book, Black Planet, Facing Race During an NBA Season. Well, I, well, I plan to get down on Black Planet, but I mean, uh, Lynch, A History, uh, I found um, so arresting uh, in terms of the way that you used storytelling um, around a sports figure with social analysis and then you did it in the the kind of literary mediatic context of assemblage, because it's really it's a it's a, a kind of a um, for for folks who haven't seen it yet, and I commend you to it on Canopy and Vimeo on Amazon, iTunes, okay. elsewhere. Um, you know, it it uses the style of reality hunger in, in the sense that it it. Uh, finds the disyecta member of this story in the media sphere and in, in newscasts and film clips and you know documentary material uh, to tell a story about um, this particular figure who embodied 
all of these struggles in terms of black folks in American history and the context of uh, you know, high stakes professional sports. It, it, it's incomparable. So, I mean, uh, in terms of how you got at that kind of equation for the film, um, what, what was your kind of um, path to making that film and, and uh, adopting that approach? No narration, no voice of God. You're just watching this kind of uh, litany of, of media artifacts. No, that's a, a beautiful summary of it. Thank you, John Philip. That, um, you know, my God, that was such a process. And it's such a good, to me, reminder of doing what a former teacher of mine once called staying open for business, which I think I quoted, deny Alexander in that Gemini Inc. interview, you know, which is a powerful idea for me, which is just means don't give up on a project just because you've hit a series of impasses doesn't mm. mean the book or film is over. I mean, it could be that, that you do hit a general, a genuine impasse. And I think there's a point at which one has to close up shop. But with this project, I had made a film with my former student, the actor director, James Franco, who had adapted my book, I Think You're Totally Wrong, A Quarrel. And then we had, I feel like we kind of had beginner's luck on it. I was so nervous on screen, it actually read as excitement, I think, on the screen. And we had, I kind of like that film. That basically it's a sort of West Coast, my dinner with Andre, where my former student, Caleb Powell, and I argue about life and art. And that Caleb and I, you know, that we're not actors, we're playing ourselves, and Franco has a small role in it. And I think it sort of works, I think, sort of, as a sort of nervous making investigation mm. of life and art. So anyway, after that film, Franco said, well, that was sort of fun. Let's try and do your book, Black Planet, as a film. Mm. And we tried a couple different versions with Franco and me and with Keegan-Michael Key, if you guys know him from Key and Peele. Yeah. And for some reason, it didn't exactly work. It was sort of disappointing. But it just, I don't know what, the book seemed dated or something. I'm not sure what. And so Franco gave the footage back to me. I tried to work on it. And then I suddenly realized, with the help of some friends, that I could get to all the questions I was trying to get to in Black Planet, basically sports culture as a reflecting pool for American history mm. through a more current example, namely Marshawn Lynch, who, you know, in the mid to the mid 2010s was a sort of charismatic presence in Seattle and the Seahawks, the Seahawks were a championship team. And I knew that his silence, he refused to speak to the American media which was generally treated as truculent or petulant or shy right. or silly. And I just knew, again, going back to my childhood, I knew as a stutterer and I knew as the son of political activists, I knew his, his silence carried violence in it and it carried politics in it. I just knew it in my bones. And I just felt strongly that his silence was being badly misunderstood. And even though I'm, you know, 30 years older than Marshawn Lynch, I'm white, I am, you know, professor, writer, in a way you could argue I had no business making the film, but I felt passionately about it. I asked Marshawn if he wanted to participate and I was secretly relieved that he said no, because the whole film is about how he doesn't talk to the media. <laughs> so if he had sat down for a 12 hour interview, it would have totally contradicted the premise of the movie. So yeah. as you say, John Phillip, in many ways, Lynch of history is the praxis to the theory of reality hunger, exactly so. All the, all the theories I spell out in, in reality hunger, a manifesto, I completely try and you might say prove or uh, demonstrate in Lynch a history. 
And so basically, when Marchand said that I won't impede you, but I won't participate, I had a couple of options. I could stop the movie, or I could talk to Marchand's uh, acquaintances, or I could sort of triple down on my approach, which I had done in Reality Hunger, I had done in War is Beautiful. So I did this collage montage approach, uh, 770 fragments over 84 minutes. That's, that's the uh, 774 fragments over? 84, it's um, one new cut every, every seven seconds. Wow. At, and often more than that. And I had wow. my intellectual property lawyer on speed dial the whole time, of course, because he, <laughs> he was effectively the film editor of the film. And yeah. you know, I'm just stunned that would that I survived that film, legally, financially, <laughs> politically, culturally, yeah. and you know the movie's available now on Sundance, and it's you know it's shown been shown all over the world. Wow. And the best thing is that I showed it in in Oakland uh, six months ago, yeah. and Marshawn had an amazing response to it. He said, uh, "I wanted to hate on you." but I couldn't because you did a damn good job with it. So that was- <laughs> Wow, well, you, you, verbosity from Marshawn Lynch. I know, and okay. then I'm probably the least smooth person on the planet, but Marshawn said, you smooth, so. You, 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 and was there some brief quelling there? It was a brief quell. It was an old Chicano exactly. term, quelling. Um, hey, two more, so, two more questions, and then we can open up, because I know everybody wants to talk to you, so. But I'm, I'm curious about two things. I mean, coming out of this amazing description of, of the Lynch film and Reality Hunger, I was kind of, I was struggling for, you know, what, what underlies this technique? And I was thinking it was uh, the closest thing, I, and maybe it's a, not even a word, but omni you know, omni the, the the way in which uh, uh, the work in Reality Hunger uh, and indeed in the thing about life, um, you know, reflects this scope of reading. You're reading books, you're reading media, you're reading, uh, you know, the, the kind of the flow of, of the everyday. This is the technical question. The technical question is, how do you hold on to it? Do you have, do you keep journals of this stuff? Do you keep, is, it a, is there a Google file? I mean, how do you uh, maintain, you know, because I'm always interested in uh, cultivating with students filtration practices for, you know, you've got all this great stuff going on, but how do you hold on to it? God, it's a fantastic question, John Phil, as have, has, have all of these. I would love to ask these questions back to you sometime, but I think it's a great term. I mean, that is exactly right. I do sort of, of read, I think I've tried to spell it right, omnilectorous is fantastic. You know, did I do sort of, and as you say, it's everything from reading, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois yeah. on American history to yeah. reading, um, you know, Key and Peel on, you know, the comedy channel and everything yeah. in between. I do agree, I am somewhat on the electorist, and it's like, I think my sister read my Trump book and she, she kind of said something slightly similar. It's like something like this is how we read now, isn't it? You know, that I'll, I'll go from sort of high semi sort of theoretical levels about the nature of neoliberalism in which I'll be quoting some pretty fancy texts to reading, you know, Stormy Daniels on Trump's bedroom antics. I mean, I'll go anywhere to get at a deeper. Um, yeah, but let me let me just restate the question because I, I really want to get. Uh, so how how do I filter? Yeah, how, how do, do I filter? How do, you, how do you get back? You, you've witnessed this stuff. You've read it or you've seen it. How are you getting back to it? Is it is it recorded somewhere? No, it's a great question. I was sort of no, it's a great question. I think we talked about it a little bit, didn't we, Donovan, in class today, where I feel like we talked a little bit, I thought it was today, perhaps, in which we talked about, given how sort of, you might say, 
um, promiscuous my reading is. It's all over the map. How does one have a filtration system, as you say, John Phillips, so that you're not just endlessly reading? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm reading with a purpose. I'm not just reading all over the place. I really have a very specific goal in mind. And I think I might have shown this one paragraph to my students in my class today, including Donovan, I think about how I basically start with a broad idea, like say in Reality Hunger or in Thing About Life or even The Trouble With Men, some big idea which is going to galvanize and magnetize all the material so that as I am reading, I'm reading through a very narrow band. I have, it feels like I have this sort of magnet and I'm trying to find stuff that the magnet can pull on. Mm. So even though it sort of looks like I'm, I'm reading all over the map, I'm not someone who keeps a diary or a journal. Mm. I keep a very focused file of material, like say my most, recent book, The Trouble with Men, Reflections on Sex, Love, Marriage, Porn, and Power. I mean, my goodness, I must have been working on that book for perhaps 15 years. I, the book at one point became literally sort of 3,000 pages of rather omni lecturous notes, which then became a very short book published a year ago. It was only 130 pages, but I think I was able to filtrate down this rather enormous material because I was always reading and writing and researching not only about sex per se, but about sex and power. I always knew that was the core of the book. And so then when I had to go from 3000 pages to 135 pages of literary collage, I had always been reading through a tight lens from the beginning, which didn't mean there wasn't a lot of work still to go of finding the gold among the draws, organizing the chapters, organizing the chapters both internally and externally. But I think it's a fantastic question, John Bell, because the, the you probably read even more widely than no I do. No way. I mean, I just, I'm always astounded by just the scope of your, of these references and <laughs> Thanks. And I'm just always wondering, you know, it's one thing to read them, but how do you get back to them? You know, how I know you, what you mean. Is it, is it like a clippings file? Is it, you know, Lawrence Wright has a very expansive technique of you know, boxed files of his research relating to his books. And so I'm always curious about, you know, the literal no kind of, so am i uh, yeah desk work of of our comrades you know and uh but that's super illuminating so hey i just want to end with one thematic question and let's let's hear from folks who are, are with us um and this is really about again returning to the the nature of this moment and and specifically in terms of the themes you explore in the the lynch um history and um and and then the the nature of, of our, our experience of the pandemia. Um, you know, what do you make of this confluence of, of the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, kind of uh, upsurge in uh, our reckoning with American history, the way that these specific lives, George Taylor, Breonna Taylor, and, and many others um, have brought us to this reckoning with this uh, deep legacy of, of racial violence in this country, of, of exploitation, of exclusion, and the pandemic. I mean, is, are, are they related? The, the pandemic on, onset and, and the, the upsurgence of this um, moment relating to America's legacy on race that you, that you uh, anatomize so uh, powerfully in, in the Marshawn Lynch film. Wow, that's a huge one. My goodness. I mean, that's, um, I mean, obviously they are in the sense that, I mean, I'd like to 
to hear you on that, obviously, as well. But I'm trying to think of what to say that You know, I'm trying to think of something useful to say that isn't just sort of political boilerplate. I mean, is, what it, is, is it, it a coincidence? I mean, is it a serendipity? Is it a, a kind of a prophetic I, moment? I, I'm I think it has to do with, I mean, the thing that comes to mind, and I'd love to hear from everyone, is... Like, for some reason, I flash on the poet Louise Glick, who recently won the Nobel Prize in Poetry, yes. you know, and Bravo. and I was thinking about what, you know, that, sh that she was interviewed when she won the Nobel Prize, and I was sort of, you know, I was thinking, you know, that her, her comments were rather anodyne, and I, I sort of wish she had said something mm. more political or something, mm -hmm. but... Um, and I think one thing that I remember that Louise Glick had said in praise of a, a book of poems that she had chosen for a book prize, mm. she talked about how much she admired this writer's poetry, a young, a young woman whose work she chose for the Yale Younger Poets series. And yeah. she said something like, no writer that she could think of is more suspicious and skeptical toward the inflation of inauthentic feeling. Louise said it slightly differently, but that was the core that some people might not get this, this young writer's poetry, but what, what made this young writer so exciting to Glick was that she was so rigorous in her deconstruction of inauthentic feeling. And I guess for me, the connection between, say, Black Lives Matter's upsurge uh, of racial injustice and COVID is that, you know, clearly what, you know, there might be a difference of opinion within this group, but, you know, that the core of Trump's response to COVID was a kind of Norman Vincent Peale, it'll all go away, there is no COVID, and that, you know, we're going to protect the stock market, I'll protect my election chances. Yeah. Instead of a, a rigorous wrestling with, I guess, to me, I can't help but think of reality hunger. Great, great work wrestles in a muscular way with the problems before us. Yeah. And so I think, you know, you know, like I remember someone who saw my film Lynch, A History, she said, you know, fairly, you know, Ijiyama Olua, who, who, who lives in Seattle, she said, I think that she liked the film pretty well, but she said, there isn't any African-American person who's going to see the film and not be aware that 400 years of African-American history are being visited on every African-American person's head every day of their lives, which is sort of the core of the film. Yeah. So yeah. She, and she was asking me for whom the film is meant. And I, you know, and so she yeah. was saying that most black people, if not all black people understood that idea in her view. So basically okay. the point I'm trying to get to in this slightly belabored way is what connects to me the horrifically inept treatment of, of COVID in this country and the, the racial injustices, you could say specifically under the Trump administration, but over, over 400 years, yeah. is a refusal to face the real, mm. uh, an, an aggressive burial and hiding from tragedy, from awfulness. Yeah. Life's difficult, you know, and th there are countries such as South Africa and Germany that have tried to wrestle with the awfulness of their past, which is something America has aggressively never done, yeah. you know. And I think it's really related, in my view, to the insanity of the COVID 
quick response. You know, great art, great thinking, great governance wrestles with what is real. Mm. And I think that, that, that's my sense of it. Yeah. I mean, we've been, we've been so, um, you know, uh, in part in our kind of symbiosis with the media coverage, we've been so uh, uh, directed to the question of what's been taken away from us rather than what's being presented, you know, and, um, and there is extraordinary uh, horizon of things that are being presented. It, it reminds me, your, your last uh, point reminded me of the, that great new um, Toni Morrison film. Have you seen it yet? The Pieces That I Am? Not yet. It, it sounds extraordinary. Oh, I, I haven't caught it yet. Fantastic. It's so amazing. And she, what she says, the, the response that you were just sharing uh, to the Marchand film, there's a moment where she's talking about, um, you know, her writing, you know, especially for the black reader. And she's talking about um, uh, Ellison's Invisible Man. She says, Invisible Man, invisible to who? Invisible to who? Um, and uh, exactly. Yeah. Hey, man, this has been great. But I want to hear from uh, our, our, um, our companions in this. Uh, Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, John. So if I could a, talk to you this is endlessly. It's a soul nourishing conversation right now. Totally. I'm, I share that. I am nourished. Uh, but let's see if uh, maybe Alexandra can share some of the questions that we might uh, explore here with our viewers. Um, yeah, no, great conversation. There's so much more that we could keep just going on. I feel nourished too. Thank you, David. And thank you, John Philip. Um, so, Please, anyone, like, type wonderful questions into the chat box. I think, um, David, you're so speedy. You already answered one or two via chat. But um, this was an interesting one. Francis, I mean, do you have any more to say about that, um, David, about um, you are among many educated persons. Do you know anyone with a PhD or MFA that adores Trump? Do these type exist? <laughs> so witness oh. account is being asked of you, David. If, like, <laughs> right. You know, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not um, avoiding the question. I'm going to stop for 30 seconds and go and use the bathroom. I'll be back in, oh, sure, in 30 sure. seconds. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be back very quickly that'll, that'll with get, uh, yeah, yeah, that'll very, give people time. I think a very, very informed Thank answer. You. Just a sec. That, that was a that was quite a workout. So the break is in order. Yeah, everyone just like feel free to take a minute. This is a good, you know, um, just a good break to uh, – put any questions you would like into the chat box for David. I'm going to check on the Chihuahua. Okay, sure. So this is our bio break moment, pause to think moment, however you would like to use it. Um, and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Uh, I feel like we have to thank you for uh, bringing him both now and in 2016, I think, when I did his last class. So it's, oh. I think it's your relationship there. So thank you. Oh, yeah. No, David was my professor at the University of Washington when I was getting my graduate degree in poetry. And I took my first creative nonfiction class with him. And he just opened up my world to what writing could be. And um, so it's kind of a, just an immense pleasure to have him teach for us. So Donovan, you took his class in 2016, too? Yeah, he came in just for like a one day. He did a reading at Trinity, and then he did a one-day class on Saturday. Um, no. So I did that class, and then I'm in the current one, the three-part Zoom one right now. You know, that's the great part of Zoom. Normally, Dave would be a quote-unquote visiting writer, and we'd whisk him in for a weekend. He'd have one class for a few hours on a Saturday, and now with Zoom, he's been able to do like a three-Saturday class. So despite obviously this not being anyone's ideal, there is just a nice way where we're able to have him a bit longer, you know what I mean, as a teacher, because he's able to do it via Zoom. Um, okay, I, great. I would love to see this going forward too, because I mean, you know, even though the in-person stuff is nice, there's, it's nice to have that week of downtime before having to be able to ask him questions again, you know, things like that, sure. that you get in that one day condensed oh, I'm kind of mentally exhausted after four hours kind of thing, so. Yeah, no, and there's so, as you can see with this talk, there's so much that David can talk about and offer. You want to be able to digest it, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I don't know if we're still on the whole topic. Then um, I think your bio break was immensely well timed because John Philip was able to get a drink, and then people have had time to put some questions in the chat box. Oh, I like it. So um, you know, but yeah, I let's think... pick up from the first question about you know, have you what about you know what have you witnessed with Trump supporters, and then we'll carry on with the other questions people are posting. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. I'm trying. I've, I've I don't know if you know the wonderful podcast called Give and Take by Scott Kent Jones. He's based in Philadelphia and he's a, a pastor and I, I've been on his show a few times and he's really interesting guy. He's is religious in ways I'm not and he's in touch with the religious right and he sort of knows a lot of those people with whom he has a civil and friendly discourse. He himself is, you know, definitely progressive, but he definitely has a religiosity and he sort of know, hey, look at the kitty John Philip brought with you. Oh wow, no, it's a chihuahua. Oh my there. god, it's a kid, it's a chihuahua. <laughs> oh my god, he's adorable, John Philip. Okay, if this was an in-person QA, we would not have John Philip's Chihuahua as a part of the <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> this the whole is, thing I guess, was... a bonus of Zoom. <laughs> yeah. We'd all That's collapse great. and we'd all just hang out with the Chihuahua. But <laughs> you know, I must I mean it's it's a funny question because I'm sort of embarrassed. Do I know? I mean, I'm not particularly proud of it. I don't think I know a single person who like I I am probably as siloed and bubbled as almost anyone. I think that, um, I mean, I think some of my in-laws might have voted for Trump in 2016. Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, I'm trying to think of someone. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I wrote that book, Nobody Hates Trump More Than Trump, an intervention in which I, I don't, I mean, I don't know those people. I, I'm really, I'm really searching myself like there is a group of people who, yeah, you know, like the 1% of the 1% who vote for Trump, who want the tax breaks, there are those people. But I, you know, the Trump book and the Trump film that I have written and am working on, I'm really, really interested, you know, in Trump's brokenness, his woundedness. He is a broken human being who is just, terribly scared, but also just immensely sad human being. And I'm fascinated by how his, his sadness, his, his, his woundedness, his brokenness actually resonates. I think it's actually a key point of connection or glue between the out of work West Virginia coal miner. I think that, that fascinates me that his, you know, when he walks daintily down a ramp at West Point and then spends 15 minutes trying to explain why he walked daintily. Like that's, there's an incredible quote by Ant Antonio Porsche. I don't know if you know his work, uh, John Philp. He was Italian born and lived most of his life in Argentina. And this incredible quote from Antonio Porsche who says, man is broken and when he makes strength his profession, he is weaker. Or actually he says, man is weak. And when he makes strength his profession, he is weaker. I mean, that's, that's it for me. Like that, that is core. That people who try to, who, who need to present themselves as only strong, there is nothing weaker than that in not acknowledging your humanness, your vulnerability, your mortality, your flawedness, mm. you know, and I think it's that really interests me about Trump. I mean, you know, and so anyway, that doesn't really answer that question. I don't know anyone who's a Trump supporter, I must admit. David, have you looked at the Mary Trump book? I, I've ordered it. I think there's your daughter, huh? This is Francesca de la Luz Santos right here. She's making a cameo appearance. This is Maestro David Shields. This is her doggy. Hola. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, she's tooting very prodigiously. So let's see now. Where 
other questions we should talk. We have about maybe 15 right. minutes of other stuff. I mean, there's another great question here about um, Donovan's asked. Well, there's two. Sheila's asked. Um, I'm just going to read her question to do it justice. I'm curious about story. About story has always seemed exceptionally important to American identity and where you think that process of storytelling goes from here. I completely agree. America has always been unusually aggressive about not confronting the ugly and painful reality of our history. I mean to write curious about. I mean to write curious about how important story has always seemed to American identity. Sheila, you can unmike yourself if you want to clarify that. I hope I did justice to your question. Yeah, I just felt like compared to people in other countries, America spends a lot of time and always has telling the sort of story of its meaning. Like we're a very narrative, I mean, other countries do too, but it tends to be more historical, whereas for us, it's a little more mythic somehow. And I think it's a great point. You know, that interests me because one of the conflicts right now seems to be that all the ugly things about our history are becoming, you know, it's like a non-functional story in a lot of ways, like the up by the bootstraps, welcome everybody, the dream of America that we're so exceptional. It feels like there's a way in which that story is, is like a machine that's starting to come apart. And I think that's interesting. But at the same time, we've always been, a, you know, like founded on an, we even say that we're founded on an idea, an ideal, and that's kind of a story. That's what I was interested in. Right. That's really beautiful. I mean, I think that, that, that rings so many bells for me. I mean, there's so much there to explore, unpack, agree with. I mean, I just think that you've captured something really powerful, which is how much of a storytelling, I mean, not to say that every country doesn't have its storytellers, obviously, but the way, the degree to which a fictional child's version of history is the default narrative mode of American history is just ludicrous. And I think that's a great point that in so many ways, whether COVID or racial reckoning or any, any number of ways, it's like that story is now throwing off sparks. Like you can only keep telling that story for so long. And it's like that we've entered this almost anti-mythologizing impulse, which one can see in a variety of ways. And I think that's, I don't know if I have anything to say to build on that other <laughs> than that really, that really interests me. It seems a great point and it seems not unrelated to a lot of my aesthetic interest, frankly, which is that I'm terribly interested in, you know, a kind of poetic poeticization of the real, like a book of mine, like say War is Beautiful, which tries to unpack the, the pornography of the aestheticization of war implicit in every color New York Times mm -hmm. war photo as part of the run up to the Iraq and Afghanistan incursion that, you know, the Times was either naively or purposefully telling a story about American freedom and exceptionalism and democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me if my connection is still fine. I got a, a little note that I had that, lost that. connection. You sound it's, fine now, David. No, yeah. Uh-oh. Um, so anyway, I think that, yeah. that Sheila's onto something incredible. Well, thank um, you. I think it's, it's interesting. It's just a topic that's been really occurring to me. And so much. We're losing you a little bit, David. Yeah. But it's something I see in your work. Totally. And I think part of it is my own, not to say one can't get to those things. I think we're having um, Sorry? issues. David, can, we, can you hear us? Did we lose your video? Did yeah. We lost. We can hear you a little Something bit. I, we, I, okay, we, yeah, you're, you. you're coming through fine. Okay. Sometimes, if when I pause video, it sometimes imp increases the audio. How is that? It's better. We can hear you better. 
one thing I can do is I can move, you know, in the last 10 minutes, I can move to a different part of the house. And oftentimes that gives me a better bandwidth. So sorry about this little. Oh, no, that's okay. This is snap. all the reality we're dealing This is, but it's, we're but actually I think hearing you fine. You, exactly. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, it's very much the real. The um, I think that Sheila's point is such a good one, though, that, um, you know, it's related to, um, tell me, tell me if it, if the sound is better now. Better. It's better. Fine. Oh, it's good. Fine. So, um, what was I going to say was that, you know, I think part of it has to, believe it or not, with my sort of falling away from the novelistic form that, you know, not to say one can't tell, you know, amazing deconstructions of American history through novels, whether it's, you know, Toni Morrison or Colson Whitehead or whoever, but there was something about the novelistic form, which especially sort of formulaic novels and sort of conventional novels. I just, I wanted the work to really throw into boldest relief the sort of exigencies of the, the real, hence my pivot in early middle age, like in my 30s and 40s toward documentary film and toward uh, sort of the poetic essay. Mm -hmm. It was just terribly important to me to get more reality in, in, into my work. I'm just, and so that's really such an interesting idea. Let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, I think Donovan asked a good question too. Um, do you think the artistic community is doing enough to try to make, quote unquote, Americans confront our blunt, uncomfortable reality? I mean, I would be loath to offer any, you know, generalized, like, yes, the community is or isn't doing enough. I mean, it depends on who those people are. I mean, you know, I think all we can do is ask of ourselves what each of us is doing, you know, in a way is what John Phillips started our conversation with, which is how am I dealing with, you know, with racial reckoning? How am I contributing? How am I not? How am I contributing to my fellow citizens amidst pandemic? We all have to figure that out. I mean, I think in many ways, there's a, a lot of lip service. Like I'm fascinated by these businesses, which, you know, they throw a Black Lives <laughs> Matter sign at, right. at Neiman Marcus and pretend that somehow takes, it's so clearly just branding. Like, let's go on with business as, as usual. Let's have Vogue magazine pretend we're gonna have a, a Black Lives Matter issue, but let's make sure the brand continues. I mean, I do think I'm obviously incredibly skeptical of everyone who just tries to throw up the most meaningless boilerplate and not do anything that's really is risk taking. I think I'm I'm really fond of this great quote by G.K. Chesterton of, of all people who was asked, "What's wrong with it? I am," which I just I just sort of of love that complicity. What's wrong with the world? I am. Like I'm really interested in asking really tough questions. Any answers you have, which only are pl placing the blame elsewhere, are to me often very limited answers. I'm hugely interested in questions which find in the human heart, in the author's own heart, th the sources of, of worldly problems. So I think if the artistic community isn't doing enough, it's that people aren't asking themselves, you know, really difficult questions. So I don't know if that answers your question, Donovan, but obviously there's a whole galaxy of people who are doing a lot. There's a whole galaxy of people who are pretending to do a lot. And there's a whole, whole lot of people who are just continuing to work. I don't know if I'm doing enough, if any of us are doing enough. I don't know. It's a tough, it's a tough challenge. I'm trying to, I could, I could, I could do more. I don't know what it's a it's a good a certainly a good challenge. Let's see. What other questions, Alexandra? Um 
I mean, those were kind of the ones I saw in the chat. If anyone has, we have about five minutes. Um, so if anyone has another question or two they would like to ask, um, you can unmute yourself and just ask it. That would be great. Or feel free to put it into the chat box. Or if John Philip wants to jump in, or if anyone wants us to return to any of the, the very the very good questions so far. Well, if I can just throw in a really quick piggyback on that last one, and this ties in with Gemini Inc.'s recent uh, Texas read. So you have a lot of conversations about white fragility and stuff like that and the things that are going on. And then they had uh, Kendra Allen on recently who wrote when you learn the alphabet. And to me, this like this great juxtaposition of, and I don't know if you've, if you've read them. I've only read her uh, Kendra Allen's book. I haven't read white fragility, but I've read a lot of essays talking about it. And I think it's a really interesting thing that white fragility blew up and it's a very academic approach. And then you have Kendra Allen's, which is very emotional, very artistic and just like grabs you by the spine and the soul and you feel the emotions and then that one doesn't blow up. And I think that's kind of like the, where that question came from. Um, and so I guess it's more of like a juxtaposition between the emotional take versus the academic take on a lot of the, the current situations. Mm. Well, that book, White Fragility, she's um, a University of Washington colleague here in Seattle. I don't know her or her work. What is Robin's last name? I forget. Robin, somebody. Donovan, do you remember the name of um, the author? Of White Fragility. I'm looking that up right now. But anyway. <laughs> Robin <laughs> D'Angelo. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And anyway, I guess she teaches in, I'm not sure what department she teaches in here, but I know what you mean. And that I do know, I don't know, I've heard of Kendra Allen's work. I, and that I, I, I do know what you mean that oftentimes the work that is more poetic, that's more soulful, that's more, you know, rich. And whereas D'Angelo's book, I don't know, I haven't read it, but it's that I think, you know, she teaches in, I don't know, perhaps ethnic studies at the University of Washington. I'm not sure exactly where, but, you know, I don't know the book, so I can't comment upon it, but I do know what you mean, Donovan, that, um, you know, I think of my work, especially the last 10 or 15 years, you know, trying to contribute to a whole range of political issues, whether war photography or racism or Trump or sexual trauma. I mean, I think of my work as being very directly addressing these issues. And yet, of course, because then my work is sort of, I hope, sort of poetically wayward, these books, you know, they find a certain amount of audience, but they're probably not terribly likely to find that huge middle brow, mid-level audience. And I know it's one of the things that, you know, people seem to want that simplified version or the you know, I don't know. It's an interesting question. You can only write how you write. You can only think how you think. And, you know, one never knows what will. I mean, I forget, Alexander, if, if you were in that class or if Paulette was in that class, in which I just did a book of mine like Reality Hunger just to try to figure out an impasse in my own writing life. It was the only, only reason I put together that book. And then to my surprise and almost slight horror, you know, that book became kind of jumped the tracks for reasons I still don't totally understand. It kind of found, I guess it just was something in the air or something. And then I guess it had these sort of killer apps that, you know, people thought that, you know, I was arguing against, quote, the novel or that I was arguing against um, copyright. So anyway, one never knows what poetic book like Kendra Allen, I'll have to read her stuff. I've heard about her, her work, but I mean, all, I believe passionately that one has to write as one has to write and one doesn't dumb one's work down in order to fit some predetermined demographic, I think. I mean, that's certainly been my approach. Um, what else? Any final words from anybody or um 
I think you're just getting some really nice comments in the chat. I mean, um, um, yeah, like um, Oz just said, enlightening discourse and great food for thought, heart, mind in these pandemic times. Thank you. Mm. Yay, thank you. That was a very great comment. Um, I mean, Bernie, you have an interesting comment. You're kind of following up on the white fragility conversation. She, um, Bernie's saying white fragility is thoughtful, but a little confrontational, which can be good but doesn't get to those who might be defensive. Perhaps poetry and lyricism can poke at the issue in a non-aggressive way and might thus attract those ready to be confronted. Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I know I mean, what you mean. I, yeah. That, so, yeah. That, yeah, the more exciting stuff, you know, ask difficult questions. It doesn't provide sort of simple answers, which, you know, isn't a bad way of thinking about a really lively conversation this this evening which is you know we're questions you know questions are good things answers are for answers are less are less easy to come by i think <laughs> that's a great that's a great comment david i think we should end on that <laughs> you know what i mean um yeah, yeah qu quest the, the questions are the key what questions you ask um well, everyone, I think this was such a rich conversation. It could clearly carry on. Um, thank you so much, John yeah. Philip. And yeah, thank you so is, much, yeah. Alexander and everyone. What, I really enjoyed it so much. What, this is what the technology is about, that, that we can do this. It's just such a wonder to me. You know, people, I, um, I remember at the end of the 90s, we were funding at great cost at the Ford Foundation, funding satellite bridges so that people could talk to each other. It was like, you know, hugely expensive and very difficult to pull off. And here we can do this uh, to have a literary conversation um, and people having Zoom fatigue, you know? People having <laughs> Zoom fatigue. Uh, so we, uh, I think we mitigated Zoom fatigue tonight. Thank you so much, David, for just um, your work and supporting Gemini Inc. You know, we need, Thank you. We need, we need you here in San Antonio. Hopefully in 3D flesh mode at some I point. I know. It'd be great <laughs> to see you again. I, uh, I miss Paulette and Alexandra and John Philip and every, everyone else. So thank you for so the, the, the really good conversation, everybody. And this was great. We'll get you here in the flesh for sure, um, David. Fun. Yeah. And thank you so much, John Philip. Amazing questions. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Yeah. Amazing questions in the chat. Um, I feel that this was a great way to spend a Saturday night and thank you so much for sharing it with us. And yeah, now we can, I'm going to go cook some, um, this, I'm sure uh, for David, this is like, uh, like Coles to Newcastle, but to, to, today at the seafood joint in San Antonio, we had clam mania. So I'm going to cook some clams and linguine. Oh, well, that sounds Yummy. great. In honor. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, David. Thanks, man. David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, John Philip. Have a great evening and a great Thank weekend, everyone. Cheers, y'all. Bye.